the last few weeks, we've been talking about a lot of things um, over the last number of months about what it means to follow Jesus. And so just to back up the train a bit, um, two weeks ago, we, we started a series called What If? And it's something really important, I, I think, that we have to, we had to talk about, and especially in, in, when it comes to faith and today, is being challenged with the faith that we like to create that is comfortable for us, but the faith that God calls us to. Because they could be, they're two distinctly different things. And so we've been looking at the life of Peter. And uh, in Matthew chapter 14, particularly when Jesus calls Peter in the water. And so two weeks ago, we talked about, um, I, I think the things that really struck me, and I'm kind of taking you on a personal journey that I've been on the last year or so. And so, you know, you, you've been really gracious with me. But what really struck me um, over the last year I've been wrestling with this story is what if Peter would have kept on walking? What if he didn't stop? What would have been different for Peter? And what moments in my life have G has Jesus called me to something great? And because it's uncomfortable for me or it's outside of my box, I've been unwilling to go. And what if my faith no longer was shaped by what works for me, but just the surrender of following Jesus faithfully and, and willing to be stepping into this risk of the wonder of God and his supernatural and what he has for me. So, uh, we talked about that two weeks ago, and last week we talked about if we're going to take those steps of faith, um, what are the things we need to work through? And last week we kind of recaptured this word courage to understand that um, when we have to take steps of faith, it is courage, but courage isn't defined by us. It's defined by the one we're willing to follow and having courage in Christ. And, and all of these things are online. And uh, on podcasts, and you could go through them. Um, I am writing a book about some of this stuff. Um, and it's a journey for me, so I'm not done yet. So I have no idea how this is going to end. Um, it might be a pop-up book. Some of you might be impressed by that. Or, or maybe a scratch and sniff. Um, so that you might be encouraged by that. Lots of illustrations. But today, um, when I was asked if, if I would share one more time, I, I want to share with something, and this is a journey with us, that I've been wrestling with. And I haven't written about it because I'm still working it through. So we get to work it through together. And it's recapturing another word. And that's the word repentance. Now when I say that, some of you might all of a sudden be like, oh yeah, here it goes. We chafe under that word. And rightfully so, because there's been a number of words in Christendom that we've, we've had to recapture. Like peace. Um, uh, peace is supposed to be this sense of being always in God's presence, but it's over, our culture has kind of shaped it to somehow be this, this very conflicting term of peace is getting my own way, even if it means me putting violence upon you. Um, that joy is moved from the sense of just inner contentment of who we are in Christ to just moments of happiness. Uh, love moved from being actually God's identity to this sense of it's just a fleeting emotion that could come and go. And so over Christmas and, and over Advent, we've, we've recaptured those words again to, to bring them back to what they mean. And, and I, I want us to do this with repentance because I think it plays a huge role in our faith. But there's a reason why a number of us right now are going to be resistant to it. Because the truth is, it's been an abused term and word, arguably, for the last 2,000 years. Um, you know, the 3rd century AD, you see where, where Constantine starts to institutionalize this beautiful Christian faith that was about relationship, and so let's make it an institution. And in, in, in the middle of all that, um, you see this word repentance starting to become uh, a word of elitism, a, a way to exclude people, include others, but ex exclude others, to create this us and them mentality. And then throughout the Middle Ages and over hundreds of years through the Middle Ages and, and growing up, we see spiritual abuse, being this word repentance using to spiritually abuse others, to be judgmental, to be vindictive. And in the last 200 years, I think one could argue that the word repentance was used as a spiritual weapon used in a way that if you didn't believe and agree with what I said, we would use that word as a repentance to just spiritually be vindictive on other people, to tell them that they're wrong or evil or heretics. Um, 
we would use this word of, when I say we, the Christian church as a whole, we would use it to mask our spiritual anger. And we would, we would try to say it's about self-righteousness and righteousness. And we would use this word repentance in such a horrible way. And so the last 30 years, in, a, in a, I think a great God-centered way, I think the Christian church took a pause and stopped and said, hold it. We've become very vindictive and we've become very legalistic. But what if faith is about love and grace and mercy? And we've seen this move in the Christian church over the last um, 30 years of this beautiful move where we've moved to grace, we've moved to mercy, we've moved to love. But in doing so, there's been a word that's dropped out of our vocabulary and started to, and that's that word repentance. Because for many of us, we look at it and say, I think repentance is just the antithesis of, of grace and mercy and love. That they two don't go together. But in doing so, there is an observation that we have to make in faith. And that's simply this. That somewhere along the line, as we've been moving towards grace and mercy and love, something's happened to faith where it's gone from being supernatural to being something that's predictable. Going from about transformation and life change to positive thinking and encouragement. And I think the two go hand in hand. I really think that what we're missing here isn't that faith is, is, is not potent, but maybe we lost an aspect of faith, repentance, which is going to bring back that supernatural life of what faith is about. So when I challenge you and encourage you with this right now today, and that's simply this. What if repentance isn't a negative turn, but is actually one of the most transforming gifts that God has given us? What if repentance is actually the gateway to grace, love, and supernatural power of Jesus Christ and faith? And so we're going to take this journey together, and we're going to do it by looking at John chapter 21. You see, because if you look at the life of Peter, as we've been doing, and especially a key moment, I think, in Peter's life, <clears throat> excuse me, in Matthew chapter 14, you can't understand the full context of what Jesus is doing in Peter's life unless you read John chapter 21. And, and I've spoken from this chapter a number of times. You could do a whole series on this chapter. It's beautiful. Too many people think that John chapter 21 is an afterthought, read, but I think it really captures not only an important faith message, but I think an important faith message critical for today. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background. So we left Peter and the disciples in the boat in Matthew chapter 14. Peter walked on the water for a bit. He panicked. Jesus does a miracle, saves him, and also calms the sea. And from then on, Peter still is trying to live his life to be Peter. And I want to make a point of that. You see, when Jesus first met Peter, Peter's name was Simon. He met him on the shores of Galilee. And when Peter started to follow Jesus, Jesus spoke into Peter's life and saying, I'm, not only, I'm not, no longer going to call you Simon. I'm going to call you Peter. And the reason I'm going to call you Peter is I've got something great for you. You're going to be the foundation of the church that I'm going to build in my name. And so Peter lived his life of faith trying to live up to being Peter, trying to be this, this rock that Jesus wanted to do. And, and if you follow the, the Gospels, you see this mountain and valley experience of Peter. He, I'll tell you, if anything, he, he was consistent in his effort. We come to a critical moment where Jesus is being arrested, going to be led to the cross. And the moment where Peter had that opportunity to be Peter is when Peter failed miserably. To the point that he was so confused, um, he had his sword ready and Jesus said it wasn't about that. And, and then Jesus is arrested. He was so confused that Peter did the unthinkable of not only wasn't he Peter, but when he had the sole opportunity to take a stand for Jesus, he, he instead he denied Jesus. And we see this in the passage in the New Testament, in the Gospels, and Peter's heart broken as Jesus looks towards him. And we see the shame and the guilt that starts to creep into to Peter's life. 
And so, as we know, Jesus rose from the grave. And he came back to the disciples, and everything was all good. But we see this dynamic, a different dynamic happening in Peter's life, where Peter went back to being Simon. And I want you to follow this. It's in, it's in John chapter 21. And it says, after this, after Jesus appeared to all the disciples, this time at the Tiberias Sea or the Sea of Galilee, this is how Jesus did it. Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, the brothers Zebedee and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter announced, I'm going fishing, and then the rest of them replied, we're going to go with you. So they went out and went and got in the boat. They caught nothing that night. When the sun came up, Jesus was standing on the beach, but they didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to them, good morning. Did you catch anything for breakfast? They said, no. Jesus said, throw your nets off the right side of the boat and see what happens. So they did what he said. All of a sudden, there were so many fish in it, they weren't strong enough to pull it in. Then the disciple Jesus loved, which is John, he's, he's actually writing it too, which is kind of funny, Jesus loved me, um, said to Peter, it's the master. And when Simon Peter realized that it was the master, he threw on some clothes. This is so funny. Um, for he was stripped for work and then dove into the sea. Crazy talk. I'm going to put clothes on to jump in the sea. Let's see how that works for you. The other disciples came in by boat, for they weren't far from land, 100 yards or so, pulling along the net full of fish. When they got out of the boat, they saw a fire laid with fish and bread cooking on it. Jesus said, bring some of the fish you've just caught. Simon eventually made it to shore, joined them and pulled the net to shore. 153 big fish. And even when, with all those fish, the net didn't rip. Jesus said, breakfast is ready. And none of the disciples even asked, who are you? They knew it was the master. Jesus then took the bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had showed himself alive to the disciples since being raised from the dead. So then after breakfast, Jesus does this. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, master, you know I love you, Jesus. And then Jesus said, feed my lambs. He then a second time said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, master, you know I love you. Jesus said, shepherd my sheep. And then he said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? So Peter was upset. When he asked a third time, do you love me? And he answered, Master, you know everything there is to know. You got to know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I'm telling you the very truth now. When you were young, you dressed yourself and went wherever you wished. But when you get old, you'll have to stretch out your hands while someone else dresses you and takes you where you want to go. He said this to hint of what kind of death, what kind of path he was going to lead Peter on to glorify God. And then he commanded, follow me. If there is ever a beautiful story, an example of what repentance is with Jesus, it's this story. And we're going to walk through it a bit to, to really unpack this. That Jesus through meets P Peter where Peter is at. Speaks to Peter as Simon because knows that right now Peter is actually living as Simon. Jesus reveals his heart and his relationship by doing that miracle again. Nothing's changed between me and you. By breaking of the bread, the sharing of his life. You know, Peter and the disciples would remember this, of Jesus sharing his life. Jesus making it very clear of how Jesus felt about them. And then through a very beautifully painful conversation, Peter experiences freedom through repentance. And I want to encourage you with, the, with you to that today as we walk through this. Because I think it's so important for our lives as people of faith is a lot of us live in our humanity or we're challenged in our faith because of the guilt and the shame that we carry. We know that Jesus loves us. We know that Jesus forgives us but we still carry the pain. And in your life today, maybe it's pain that others have caused you, hurt, emotional injury, mental injury. Maybe it's a sense of failure. 
Maybe it's a sense of your choices and sin. Sin meaning totally missing the mark of where God had led you, like Peter. And I'm sharing with that with you today because I think every single one of us carry such heavy weight in our heart, in our lives, that we live our faith managing our guilt and our shame because we're afraid and we think repentance is a bad thing. And I want to encourage you today that where Jesus met Peter, where he was at, Jesus has you here because he's meeting you right now where you're at. He's speaking to you by name. And he's saying to you, I want to free you. And he's leading you right now to a moment of repentance. And if you forget anything I'm going to say today, I want you to remember this. That repentance is not judgment or a sentence of sin and guilt. It's actually a gift of deliverance, salvation, transformation, and hope. You can throw that up for us. Repentance isn't judgment or sentence of sin and guilt, but is a gift of deliverance. It is a gift of salvation, transformation, and it's a gift of hope. So you're asking me right now, and we're walking together, so what does that look like? The first thing it looks like is simply this. It's confession. And confession means surrendering that burden and letting go and letting God. The reason I said it was such a beautiful interaction, I want want us to unpack this a bit between Jesus and Peter. So Peter is decided to live as Simon again. He goes back to the beginning and Jesus meets, oh, what a beautiful story. Jesus meets Peter where he's at. He meets him again at the beginning. As the psalmist said, created me a Genesis week. This is what what, um, uh, Jesus is doing for Peter. He's creating a new moment. We're going to redefine this, Peter. We're going to have a a do-over. And then as Jesus, after he reveals himself, Jesus starts peeling the layers of the onion. On Peter, Simon, do you love me? Yeah, Jesus. Jesus showed that he loved Peter. Peter's like, yeah, I love you. Jesus peels the next layer. And we hear angst in the story. Peter, do you love me? Or Simon, do you love me? And Peter says, and you, you, you know what's happening here. We can make that good assumption. Peter starts wrestling with, the ebbs and flows of life, the journey they they were on together. And he says, oh, Jesus, you know that I love you. Like, I was impetuous, but you know that I love you. And a third time, and let's not, I don't want to make this overboard, but let's say this isn't just coincidence. Peter denies Jesus three times. The third time when Jesus asked him, he peels to that deeper, deeper level of that onion. And Peter, faced with probably his greatest guilt and shame, oh, I says, Jesus, you know that I love you. And in that moment of confession, Peter, Simon at the moment, again, as he was identifying himself, was free. He was free of all the failure, all the pain, all of his guilt and shame from denying Jesus, he was free. Confession somehow has become a bad word in faith today because we think that confession labels us. We think that confessing my sin and my shame and my guilt means that I'm going to put myself out there and it's just going to be that scarlet letter. It's going to writ on me and I've labeled and identified myself with all my failures. And that is so untrue. You know how fear speaks lies lies into our lives? We talked about it last week. We need to name those lies and name God's truth. Guilt and shame does the same thing. Guilt and shame says, you can't share this. You've got to bury it. Because if anybody knew, it would even be worse for you. 
and it tries to bury us when really holding on to guilt and shame just creates a dungeon for yourself. And we're trapped and we're burdened. Confession is freedom. Confession is taking the weights of all of that and just giving it to God. And God saying, thank you very much. There it goes. And being absolutely free. Brene Brown says it this way. She says, shame or guilt is the most powerful master emotion. It's the fear that we're not good enough. Shame or guilt corrodes the very part of us that believes we are capable of of change. As long as we don't confess, we bury ourselves in a false sense of identity and we can't capture the identity that Jesus has for you. Peter identified as Simon because of the guilt and shame in his life. And he walked away from his identity as Peter. So too, we rob ourselves of the identity and the love that Jesus Christ has for us when we're not willing to confess and give it over and allow Christ to redefine us. Billy Graham says this. He says, confession is this amazing gift of getting rid of everything that hinders God's control of our lives and placing us totally in God's hands. So I want to speak against the lies of guilt and shame. And I want to speak into your life a little bit of truth here. Because guilt and shame will say that you're not worthy, that you're a failure, that you can't tell anybody Because of how bad it's going to make you look. But these are the words of Jesus. John chapter 1, Jesus says this. uh, That we reveal that Jesus is the creator of this, the universe. The Genesis God. Who is light blazing in the darkness. The darkness couldn't contain him. Darkness is just the absence of who he is. That he's absolute, all powerful, all love, all good, all knowing. Joy, grace, mercy, peace. And then John 1 says, and he came that all who would receive him would become children of God. He didn't come to, came that we become children of God. Not flesh begotten, but God begotten. And then in John 3, 16, that that we go a little bit further, that he came out of love for us. Not out of um, condemnation for us, but of love. That whoever would believe in his name would have eternal life because, and Jesus makes it very clear, I didn't come to the world to condemn it, I came to save it. In John 10.10, I came to give life and life more abundantly. That Jesus is meeting you where you are today, not to punish you for what has gone on in your life or the guilt and shame that you carry, but he's come to free you. Revelation chapter 3, it says that Jesus says in verse 20, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. Jesus never shuts the door. You know who does? Me. You. We shut the door when we don't want to let Jesus in. We're afraid to confess. But 1 John 1, 9 says this, if we confess our sins, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to take and cleanse all of the unrighteousness. This morning, Jesus is meeting you where you are at. He sees your heart that you want to live this what-if life of faith, of abundance. And he's asking you the question, do you love me? Today, we have an opportunity just to confess And be vulnerable and transparent before God. And let it go and let God. But repentance doesn't stop there. It's not just confession. Repentance is a turning. It's a turning of our hearts. And a choice to actively follow Christ. And the life that Christ has for us. Jesus three times says, Peter, this is what I want you to do. Feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Calling Peter back wasn't giving Peter a task. It was calling Peter back to the calling of being Peter. Peter, remember, Simon, remember I called you Peter for a reason. You're going to build my church and I'm I'm inviting you again. 
to do it. I'm asking you to live and follow this life of richness. What a beautiful story. And then he just says, Peter, will you follow me? In Acts chapter 2, we see what Peter decided to do this time. And the rest is history. Peter decided to not anymore live the life of Peter or Simon or try to become Peter on his own, but actually lived a life of following Jesus in a very vulnerable and risk-filled and wonderful way. However Jesus wanted to use him, whether it was healing some person or speaking to thousands of people, didn't matter. Peter was going to be Peter and follow the life that Jesus Christ had laid out for Peter. Can I encourage you today? Romans chapter 8 reminds us that Jesus' life and love for us is not just the forgiveness of sins, but that when Jesus defeated sin and death on the cross, he defeated any barrier that would get in the way of the perfection of what he wants to create in your life. That God just didn't create you as a human being with a human name, but a spiritual calling and a spiritual purpose. And that there's nothing physical or spiritual, angelic, demonic, higher, low, past, present, or future. There's nothing that can get in the way of God's love for you and his calling for your life. And we say, well, God, the problem is how do I follow you? And Jesus says, I'll make it clear. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You know what bugs me? A lot of things. But I'll tell you one in particular. When people say to me, oh, John, that is such a restrictive scripture passage. Are you kidding me? Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, instead of saying, here are the pieces, go try to make life on your own and figure it out. Jesus says, no, I'm the creator God and I'm perfect. I've made a perfect life for you. And not only that, but I've created a perfect way for you. And it's an invitation to every single one of us. There is only singular way because there's only one perfect road. You could take other mediocre roads or you could take the one that's going to just allow you to experience the fullness of who Jesus is. And that's why we follow in faithfulness to Jesus. It's not legalism, but it's because every step we follow in Jesus, we experience this Genesis week in our life of becoming who Jesus has called us to do. And how can I say that with confidence? Because of the fruit. Galatians 5 says that the fruit of following Jesus faithfully, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, grace, patience, goodness, kindness, meekness, self-control. Jesus is a God of wonder. Rachel, I thank you so much for sharing this story about the turtle. If God has such a beautiful life for that turtle, or we talked about last week, for a caterpillar to become a butterfly, how much more does he have for you Because he created you in his image. And when he created you, it was intentional. And he created you and he said, this is good. As human beings, we were given a name. Peter was Simon, the son of John. And Jesus says, but I have another name for you, if you're willing to follow me. Paul writes it this way in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. It's in Christ that we actually find out who we are and who we truly are, who we live for. Long before we heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eyes on us, had designs on us for glorious living. Part of this overall part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and in everyone. I want you to read that. Just take take a moment to read that. And I want you to put your name in there. That's in Christ that you find out who you are, what you're living for. Long before first heard of Christ, got your hopes up, he had his eye on you, had designs for you for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and in everyone. That's why Paul says to Titus, Titus chapter 2. It says, Titus, if I can encourage you with one thing, brother. Stop trying to, you're saved. Why are you trying to live 
and the people in your church trying to live their lives and asking me to make the life that they're living a little bit better. Why would you be rescued from the dungeon only to want to go back and live in it? That salvation isn't about just being free from the dungeon and going to Ikea and coming back and making it a nicer place with like, like these you know, mattresses and all the nice little decor and the lights. It's about getting open that dungeon door and taking a bolt for it and never looking back, living a new life. Paul says, you know, I'll even mention this about myself. He said, I'll tell you, I haven't obtained it yet, but I'm going to tell you one thing. Every moment of every day, man, I'm giving her. And I'm going towards it. I'm living this life that Jesus has for me. And I'm not turning back. And there's nothing. And nobody's going to stop me. And no one can. That's what Christ calls us to. Repentance is not just a confession and a surrendering. But it's this beauty of being able to step in once again into the identity that Christ has given us. And live it and walk in it. And live through it and be committed to it. And I can't stress this enough. Because how much in faith. Do we confess we're free and then we go back to make the same choices we did before? God's freed you from that life. He's freed you from those choices. He has a life for you that is fruit in abundance. Start living the life that he's called you to. Not the name you've been given, but the name he gives you as a child of God. Or as Lecrae would say it, live your life like someone died for you. So, today, we're not just going through a verbal exercise, but we're going through a beach moment, just like Peter did on the shore, because I think Jesus is every single one of us here, because you are carrying stuff in your life that is keeping you from the life that Jesus has for you, and he's calling you to an opportunity today of repentance, of confession, And I'm making some choices moving forward. So here's my question for you. What are you going to choose? God already made his choice. There is a voice. So the Bible narrative is this narrative of the same message that we see relived over and over through generations of people's lives. And it's consistent. And you and I are part of that narrative. And there's a voice, though, of God's is so consistent. And one of the things God consistently says all through God's word from Deuteronomy through the New Testament to today is if you repent and call upon me, confess your sins, humbly turn to me and seek my presence, I'll listen to you and I'll restore you. That's God's words to you today. So what's your choice today? What's our choice? As a family, we come together because we celebrate Jesus together. We challenge each other, but most importantly, we interact with who Jesus is and what he's calling us to. Because we're not talking about Jesus today. We firmly believe and we know that the risen Lord is actually here with us, his spirit with us. Always. Like that song says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, I know you're working, you're here. You never stop. And so God is meeting you in this moment, and he wants to define this Genesis moment for you. And today as we worship, as we sing, as we take some time, I can't, I'm not going to coerce you, because it's your choice. I can only speak truth into your life. This is the moment that Jesus wants you to lay it before him. Jesus says, I I see your courage. I see your desire for more. But today I'm giving you a gift, an opportunity, and that's a, a repentance moment. So as we worship and as we pray together today, I encourage you to, however you're wired wherever you're at to make that moment of confession today. For some of you, you're going to need other people to pray with you, and you want to. For others of you, you need to be alone, but you need to do, we need to do this. 
We need to allow ourselves to be free of the guilt and shame. And also a commitment today to turn because God has called you and you know what the voice is. You see God's word. And you know, he knows you, you're given a human name, but he's given you a name and a calling. And he wants you just to follow his steps, living rightly in love and peace. Today, that's our opportunity. However God is speaking to you, all I can do is encourage you and simply say, let this be the moment of repentance today. And as, if there's a scripture, I'd like you to mull over. It's, it's in Acts. It's in Acts chapter 3. And I want you to, uh, um, it's going to be thrown up on the screen. I just want you to mull over just for a second before we pray. And before we lead in worship and before we interact. And it's this. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins and your convictions may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. God's ready to refresh your spirit. Let's stand together. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for who you are, your salvation, your grace, and your love. Lord, I thank you for this journey of faith you called us on. But today, Lord, I thank you so much that even when we get buried with our sin and guilt, we think we failed, that you come to where we are at. God, that today, as we've been sharing your word, your spirit has been speaking into our hearts and telling us how much you love us, you care for us. And God, as painful as it is, you've been poking at the burdens we've been carrying, the, shame, the, the, the sin and the shame and the, the guilt. No, Father, I pray today by the power of your Spirit, as you did that day on the beach with Peter, Spirit of God, would you convict our hearts, soften our hearts, that we may confess to you, surrender those burdens to you, God, that we may be lifted and free. God, set on a new path with you. Oh God, just work in our lives. I want you to take this moment and just have that honest conversation with Jesus. Let him peel the layers. Be transparent.